So also, as you're turning to Joshua chapter 7, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 1. So keep your place in Joshua 7, 1 Corinthians 1. We find ourselves about 200 years after the death of Joshua. The children of Israel are in the land, and I believe that if you've been here with us for a couple weeks, that you can see that Israel is not following after the Lord. And that's one of the messages that Joshua had given to the children of Israel at the end of Joshua. He basically told them, don't stop doing what got you to this place. And what were they doing? They had, they had obeyed the Lord. And when they obeyed the Lord, they found victory. They found life. They were able to take territory. And now we're seeing them in this cycle of sin. And we see that disobedience and compromise always leads to defeat and bondage. That's what we see in the book of Joshua, or excuse me, in the book of Judges. And that's also what we see in our lives. And so while the The cycles of sin we don't necessarily see today because that was Israel-centric and we're under the new covenant. We can see similarities uh, to it. Here's another way of looking at the cycle of sin where you start out with rest and peace and then compromise and disobedience. It leads to rebellion and idolatry. And then famine, war, and slavery is specifically what uh, Israel experienced, and you could put in there, you know, for us, bondage. And then there's a time when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired of your sin, and you cry out to the Lord, and you repent, and God hears, and then God delivers. And then there's the little music uh, symbol there that means repeat. So rinse and repeat. And that's, that's kind of the cycle that we find Israel in. We've already studied a number of judges or deliverers, so Othniel and Ehud and Shemgar and Deborah, and now we're going to get into Gideon. Gideon, uh, we found his calling really in chapter 6, but he's the fifth judge of Israel. Now chapter 7 is probably more well known than chapter Six, other than the the fleeces that he lays out, and chapter 8. So chapter 7 is a very well-known chapter in the Bible. And what's interesting is the main point of chapter 7 is actually found in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's why I had you uh, put a little marker in there. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 27 We read, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so that's how God sets things up, even in our lives today, where Uh, we're the underdog or where we find we're in a situation where it seems like there is no way, but we serve the God of the impossible. And he ends up seeing us through, and then we have to give him the glory. So in verse 1 of Judges chapter 7, then Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. So if you remember Jerubbaal, that is uh, Gideon's uh, new name that was given to him in the last chapter, and it means Baal will contend or contend with Baal because he had torn down uh, the altar of Baal. So his new name, interestingly enough, would be a constant reminder of the futility and the lifelessness of idols. So every time his name was heard, it would be a rebuke in the people's face for their worshiping of the Baals. Here's a, here's a picture to kind of give you a, a, a view of, of where we find ourselves. So you can see here's the Sea of Galilee. Here Israel would be way down uh, to the south. Uh, But we're looking really at this area right in here. It's actually a very long, um, 
you know, flat valley uh, called the Jezreel Valley. And that happens to be uh, the place where many famous battles happen in the Bible, uh, as well as in just secular history. But it will be the final gathering place of many nations in the tribulation. And you know that's referred to as Armageddon. And so this is the same valley where Sisera defeated, excuse me, where Deborah defeated Sisera. Verse 2, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. And so how many people does Gideon have? Well, the text will say that he has 32,000 warriors with him, which initially that seems pretty impressive. But we learn from chapter 8, verse 10, that there were 135,000 Midianites. And that, by human estimation, is horrible odds. That means that's four to one. That means for every Israeli, they would have to kill four Midianites. But what we're seeing here is that God is not trying to build self-confidence in Gideon and the people. He's trying to build God-confidence in them. And I think we should understand, and, and hopefully we are learning this, that a person can't be too small for the Lord to use, but he can be too big. God knows our hearts, that we're prone to take credit for the things that he does. Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 8, uh, chapter 8, yep, It's basically a prophetic indictment against Israel. And so if you're a note taker on paper or on the margin, you could put Deuteronomy 8 there. Because he's talking to uh, Israel, it's the days of Moses, and God knew that when they came into the land and when their bellies were full and when their crops were plentiful and when their wealth had increased, that they would forget the Lord who brought them out of Egypt and fed them manna and gave water for the entire nation from a rock. They would actually forget their God. And in Deuteronomy 8, 17, he says, and then you're going to end up saying in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Well, God went on to tell them that he would bring them low and chastise them to get them on the right track and then end up having a good relationship with them in the end. So God's way is the only way. The odds start out at four to one, but for God, he says what? He says, that's too many. That's too many. Even if they won the battle, he knows their heart, and he knows that they would take credit. Well, verse three, now therefore, Gideon, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So 32,000 is too many. He tells Gideon, anyone who has any reservation, you can just, bye-bye now, you can go on home. 22,000 left. Wow, two-thirds, 10,000 remain. You maybe thought, well, this army that Gideon has assembled, they're They're faithful and they're strong and they know no fear. And maybe he thought, okay, yeah, we could do without 20 people. We could do without 50. But 22,000 end up heading home. They left the ranks. And here's this this once afraid wheat threshing in a winepress Gideon. He's watching his army disappear and walk away. What are the odds now? The odds go from 4 to 1 to 14 to 1. But really, that's a good thing. Because if you had fearful people in your ranks, that could be disastrous because fear can be contagious. God just got rid of what could have been a very, very big problem, a very negative aspect among the men. And then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. You could almost hear Gideon going, what? Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there, that it will be that when, that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whoever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. And so he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, 
you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink the water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. This is remarkable. Here, Gideon marches his army down to the water, just like God had said, so great obedience on Gideon's part. And then God tells Gideon, I want you to notice how they're drinking the water. And this is how God would further call people out of Gideon's army. And so either they would get down on their knees and then they would lap up the water with their tongue, or they would drink by putting the water in their hand and they would be upright and then they would put it to their mouth. And you go, okay, well, what is God doing here? Well, number one, God is is shrinking down the army to a small amount where the odds are so astronomical that there can be no way that they could possibly take credit. So that's the first thing. But there's another thing uh, behind the scenes where God wanted men who stayed upright. He wanted their heads up. Aside from being God's way of paring down the army, it's, it's a picture of, of alertness, isn't it? They were ready. Some of the men were alert and mindful of the enemy, and some of them were oblivious. And so God chose the ones, interestingly enough, who were alert and aware. Great application uh, for us in verse 6 and 7, that if you bow to anything but the Lord, you will not be effective in your God-given ministry. And so we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus and, and keep our keep our eyes towards heaven and be alert to the Holy Spirit because he's the one who's going to guide us into all truth. Now, where are the odds now? So it went four to one and then 14 to one and now it's 450 to one. Gideon's army, if you do the math like I did this afternoon, it's, it's shrunk down to 1% of its original amount that it was just a few hours prior. Notice how God reminds Gideon of his word and plan in verse 7. He says, By these 300 men, I will deliver the Midianites into your hand. That was a, probably a very needed encouragement to Gideon at this point. Well, so the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. God is really testing Gideon. He's testing his faith. I believe that it's it's good that our faith is tested. It's been said that a faith that is not tested or a faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. And so we're given opportunities to trust the Lord and feed on his faithfulness. And the more and more we do that, we end up finding out and reminding ourselves really that God is good and he can be trusted and that he always comes through on his word. God tests our faith, I believe, for two reasons at at least. One is that God tests our faith so that we can know if we have genuine faith or not. Is our faith real or is it counterfeit? Does Does our faith stand up to impossible odds or difficulty or great sickness, or the death of a loved one, or the loss of a job? Is is our faith strong enough to get us through the the deepest aspects of, of human life? That's important for us to know. It can be challenged, and we can have those seasons where we're we're growing, we're learning, we're asking God, we're talking to Him, but you know what? In the end we realize, oh. This faith is real. God is real. But that's number one. Number two, real and genuine faith is strengthened when it is tested. God loves when we put our trust in him and honor and worship him in spite of our present circumstances. Charles Spurgeon said, the promises of God shine brightest in the furnace of affliction. 
And isn't it true? We can read books about faith. We can talk about faith. We can sing about faith. And we can pray about faith. We can recall and we can discuss the faith of maybe our parents or a, an amazing uncle or amazing aunt or the faith of our grandparents. But you know what? That's all great, but we can't exercise the faith of our grandparents. We can't exercise the faith of our parents or that uncle that maybe invested into you or, or, or whatever. We can't deploy the faith of someone else. It has to, be, has to be our faith. Our faith has to be constantly growing. I love these two verses. Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's a good one. Zechariah 4, 6. And so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. God is looking for people to trust him who are wholeheartedly following after him. And he can use, as we are seeing in this text, anyone who is willing to let God work through their lives. God's looking for, for vessels that he can fill and, and use. And he'll take an impossible situation and work it out for his glory and your eternal good. You just have to be willing. You just have to be yielded to him. With Gideon, it might have been a very, very hard thing for him to watch his army dwindle, but Gideon was obedient to God. And for those of you who know the end of the story, God showed up very, very powerfully, didn't he? Another great verse about God using us is found in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. And it says this, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God is looking. He's looking for people to be able to use for his glory. The great preacher John Wesley, he may have been thinking of Gideon's small army when he said, give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and love nothing but God, and I will shake the gates of hell. That's a good one. That's why I put it up for you. <laughs> Verse 9. And it happened on the same night <clears throat> that the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hands will be strengthened to go down against the camp. Well, then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion and he said, I've just had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Well, then his companion answered, and he said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And what's interesting here is that although Gideon didn't ask for it, God confirms his calling and his direction and the whole plan and strengthens Gideon by the hearing or the overhearing of the general conversation of the army. You sneak on in there in the middle of the night and you just listen to what they're talking about in their tents. They may have heard of Gideon tearing down the altar of Baal, but one thing's for certain, they were afraid. Now, <clears throat> What's the barley loaf in this dream? It is interpreted by the text itself as being Gideon. A barley loaf? Could you imagine Gideon there? He's trying to be quiet and he's listening to the dream. It's a barley loaf that came and attacked the Midianites. And he's like, are you kidding me? I'm a barley loaf in the dream? Can't I be anything else? Like a boulder or a tank or at least a massive ox? It's good that God will give us confirmation of, of things, but God is, God is God. He has a great sense of humor, doesn't he? 
It, the barley loaf was the, it was the food of, of slaves. It was a very inexpensive way to get you know, energy into the body. And that's the picture that we have before us, isn't it? It's just a, a guy, Gideon, threshing wheat in a wine press when he's supposed to be threshing wheat in a threshing floor, and he's very timid and unsure and all that. So it's a good thing that God will give us confirmation of things. I see him do this in my life after I'm moving forward with what he's already told me. So confirmation is good, but I'll tell you, some of the best confirmation comes after you start moving forward in what God has already told you to do. It's good to be in that place where God is confirming things because your heart is strengthened, your faith is strengthened, but then also you're able to strengthen the heart and the faith of other people as you share uh, that confirmation. And when you do share that, oh, guess what the Lord did this week? What? And you tell them that it encourages their faith too. And it blesses the Lord because we're bragging about him. Verse 15, and so it was. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshiped, and he returned to the camp of Israel, and he said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. And then he divided the 300 men into three companies, three groups of 100, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And then he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do just as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow trumpets on every side of the whole camp, and you say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So he's, he's edified, he's encouraged, he goes back, he rallies the troops, he tells them what to do, he explains the TPTP tactic that they'd be using against the Midianites. Maybe you're wondering what the TPTP tactic is. It stands for Trumpet Pitcher Torch Plan. I mean, it's, I mean, it should be a common thing. It worked well in Gideon's day. Now, you might notice something. Did we ever hear, thus saith the Lord, takest thou a trumpet in your hand along with an earthen vessel and a torch, says the Lord? And no, we didn't hear that. God doesn't tell, or there's not a record at least, of God telling Gideon what to do. So a couple of things here that are interesting, at least to me, is that that may have come up naturally in his mind. We don't have a record. But what we do have a record of is Judges 6.34 in the previous chapter that says that Gideon was a spirit-filled man. The Holy Spirit of Jehovah God had come down and upon Gideon in a very powerful way. And I'm just going to tell you guys this that a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, are quite powerful against very strong enemies when they're filled with the Spirit and are yielded to the Spirit. And I'll tell you, more often than not, I see this in my life, I see this in other people's lives, is that God will move and lead supernaturally through the natural. So he's got the Holy Spirit. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit. He has a calling upon his life, and he's trying to be obedient, and it could very well be that he just he, he had this, this thought in his mind, and he's looking around, and he sees 300 trumpet cases lined up against the mess hall tent, and he's like, oh yeah, this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, but it was really the Holy Spirit. I don't know if it worked out that way, but God will work supernaturally through the natural. And I love what he says in verse 17, where he says, look at me and do likewise. Look at me and do likewise. Or follow me and I will make you fishers of men, Jesus said. Or Paul, he said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If you have a King James Bible, it will probably say, follow me as I follow Christ. But the, the Greek word is where we get our English word imitation. And so some of the more modern versions have imitate uh, in place of follow. So you've got Gideon. We know that even though he started out a little timid, that he was a man of action. 
He was a doer. He understood that that leadership is not about lecturing. It's about leading. Leadership is not you go. It's let's go. And so here we go. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, middle of the night, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Maybe you're wondering, why did they cry out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon? Like, why did, they, why, why did Gideon tell them, hey, put that little and of Gideon. Make sure that they know it's of Gideon. Do you think that was any kind of pride on Gideon's part? No, I don't think so. I think it was wisdom. Clearly, the Midianites, as we just read, were already afraid of Gideon and the sword of Gideon. And shouting this would probably help them uh, in, in sending the Midianites into a panic. So they, they might not have known who the Lord was, but they knew who Gideon was. Verse 21, And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. So these Midianite soldiers awoke to an explosion of noise and light and movement coming at all directions. And no wonder they thought that they were being attacked by an even larger army than they were. And what I find fascinating as well is that the first portion of the battle wasn't even between Israel and the Midianites, was it? The first part of the battle was between Midianites and Midianites. In the confusion, they start attacking each other and taking each other out. You see that the original work was started with just a few, which was God's design. And in verse 23, Gideon is inviting other tribes to be a part of the work for the team to grow, for more to join uh, the fight. I look at that and I see that in, in our you know, view and understanding that God, he's a big tent God. He's a big tent God. He commands us to go to the highways and to the byways and invite as many as we can to taste and see that the Lord is good. And I tell you, it's always wonderful to do things with teams, to do things with people, and not do things um, on your own. Well, then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. And they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Great lesson for us that God doesn't need great numbers in a congregation or a church in order to accomplish his work. He just needs people who are willing to answer the call. People who are willing to say, like Isaiah did, I will go send me. He doesn't need great experience, great degrees, pedigrees. He doesn't need big budgets and boards and hordes of money. He just needs people who are willing to be available to him to use as he sees fit. You probably have, you probably have heard of the, the great missionary who is a pioneer uh, in missionary work to China. His name was Hudson Taylor, and he believed firmly that God knew his needs and that God would always meet his needs. And on one occasion, when Taylor's assets were down to 97 cents, excuse me, 87 cents, he wrote to a friend, we have this and all of the promises of God. That was the attitude that Hudson Taylor had. 
This is the faith that sees the invisible and the eternal. And that's the kind of faith that pleases God the Father when we stand on the promises of God and when we say, God, if you've called me to it, then you're going to lead me through it. Or just that, that spirit-filled, you know, promised land living life where we're standing on the promises of God. When facing a 135,000 Midianite level trial, God can take him out with 300. God just needs a vessel. He just needs someone that is willing to say, I want to go. I want to honor the Lord. I want to I serve him. I want to stand up for such a time as this. Additionally, when you look at, at this history here, where they had the torches inside these clay pots, and at the right moment, they broke the pots, and they blew the trumpets, and, and all of that. And you're thinking, that's a lot of broken pottery. <laughs> yes, it is, but it, it, it paints a very amazing picture for us that it took the breaking of the pots for the light to shine through, for the enemy to cry out, and for the enemy to flee. And as I look back in my life, and I... I know a lot of other people that have gone through this and I've read books about it and I see the testimonies that we have in the scripture. Oftentimes, oftentimes, before there is victory and before there is traction and progress or the win, there is a breaking process that takes place. If you think about the New Testament, in Jesus' ministry, the bread that was multiplied and fed was first broken. It had to be broken before it was multiplied to feed 5,000. The body of Jesus was first broken before the number of believers could be added and multiplied to the church. Another great verse out of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And then he goes on to talk about how we might be broken, but we're not crushed. He goes down this, this list of things. So just think about that. And just think, Lord, maybe... You're getting ready to do something amazing in my life. And right now, this is a breaking process because there's things that I need to learn. There's truth that I need to latch on to in order to, you know, not just see you have the victory in my life, but also walk that victory out in my life. Well, chapter 8. Now, the men of Ephraim said to Gideon, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. What? There's a great victory. The heads of the two princes, Oreb and Zeb, were off. They were off, and they had quite the, the ironic or Shakespearean death, right? Where Oreb, he died at the Rock of Oreb, and Zeb, they killed at the winepress of Zeb, all right? And so, but why is Ephraim upset? Then they're saying, you should have called us. You should have called us. They were upset because they were not included in the initial part of the battle against the Midianites. Now, Gideon had called the tribes that were closest to the Midianite camp at the beginning, as well as when the Midianites were on the run. And Ephraim was called up in verse 34 of the previous chapter because the fleeing enemies seemed to be making their escape through the mountains to the south, which was their territory. I believe we have the map again. Do we have the map there? Maybe we do. There we go, we do. And so as they attacked the Midianite army, they started fleeing in this direction, okay, which would have been in this direction here, and then do we, have, do we have the map with all the tribes on it? No, I don't. Okay. Well, the, the point is, is that as they moved in this direction and tried to flee into the mountains of Ephraim, this was where the tribe of Ephraim was located, if that makes sense, in central Israel. 
And so that's why they weren't called up at the very, very beginning. So they were this large tribe. They were an important tribe in Israel, and they were kind of the tribe that would also tell you that they were an important tribe in Israel. They had two major cities that were used in, in these days as rallying points or were major you know, things took place. So they had, uh, in their tribal area, they had Bethel, and then they also had Shiloh. What important thing do we find at Shiloh at this time in biblical history? The tabernacle, the tabernacle, where God said, I'm going to be worshipped at the place that I determined. And at this point, he determined that he would be worshipped at this place called Shiloh. Uh, something else that they could also claim was a relationship with Joshua because Joshua was an Ephraimite. So they had all this going for him. But even now, they had still been allowed to be a part of God's great deliverance of Israel. But rather, rather than rejoicing with Gideon and the people, they have a fiery complaint. Why have you treated us like this? <laughs> You kind of look, you look at the text and you can almost hear it now where we've maybe had complaints, you know, or people said to us, why didn't you call? I didn't know. Or you weren't around. Or you didn't pick up. Well, why didn't you leave a message? Your voicemail box was full. Or it wasn't set up or whatever, you know. They also, it's, it seems, they may have been coveting the great spoil that would have been taken from the initial battle by the mountain of Moreh, because there over 100,000 men died. And it was common in that day to, to take everything of value off of a soldier out of a town or whatever. And that's the, that's the spoils of war, right? And they, they realized this that a great victory had taken place, and they're thinking, oh man, why, like we, mm, we wanted to be a part of that. Those Midianites, they have cool weaponry. And, and they're thinking, Gideon, we, we should have been called for this. Well, the thing is, is when people criticize you, there's a, oftentimes some personal reason that they have for doing so, and you and I may never know the real reason why. We might not ever know uh, the, the criticism. The, the thing for us is that we can be secure in our relationship with the Lord, and to be reminded from Romans chapter 8 that in Christ there is now therefore no condemnation so that's, that's where we need to land. So they should have been blessed that there was a victory over the Midianites and that the mop-up situation, the mop-up operation was already underway and that they got to be a part of that. So instead of celebrating the victory, they criticized the strategy. And so Gideon said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? And then their anger toward him abated or subsided when he said that. That is great diplomacy by Gideon. He, he's saying, no, what, what you guys have done is actually far greater than, than anything that I've done. You guys have captured the two Midianite princes, Oreb and Zeb, their heads are still, yeah, well, they're over there, but I mean, good job, you guys. You guys did it. Now, here's a question. He tells them a kind of a poem, kind of a saying that we might not get. And he says, is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizer? Okay, the vintage or the whole harvest of Abizer. Well, Gideon was an Abizrite, which was of the clan of Manasseh. So he's talking about his, his group, okay, his subgroup. And what he's saying is our vintage or our typical harvest can't even be compared with just some of the grapes that are gleaned from your vineyard. You guys are amazing. I'm just, I'm just a country boy trying to serve the Lord. That's what he's, that's what he's saying there. What we did is, is very insignificant compared to what you guys did. You guys tracked down, you captured and beheaded ugh, Oreb and Zeb. That's amazing. And their wrath subsided. 
Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You could say that Gideon may have been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1256 B.C. if they had such a thing back then. Ronald Reagan said this, There is no limit to what a man can accomplish if he doesn't care who gets the credit. He was a wise man. The same goes for the body of Christ. There's no limit to what we can accomplish if we don't care who gets the credit, but just that Jesus gets the glory. Do everything, whatever you do, whether it's in word or deed, do all things for the glory of the Lord. So we do care who gets the credit, but we want to make sure that Jesus gets the credit. Real Christian maturity is on display when love overcomes the critical nature of the flesh. Real Christian maturity is on display when brothers and sisters in Christ can dwell together in unity. That's where mature Christianity is is being worked out. Psalm 133, verse 1. Real Christian maturity is on display when you can be a peacemaker rather than a fighter. Real Christian maturity is on display when the person knows who the real enemy is. So you could, you could see how this could have gone sideways really, really quick. Oh, yeah? Well, your heads are going to come off too, like Oreb and Zeb. Like you, I mean, that could have happened that way. But for Gideon, he recognized that the Midianites were the enemies, not the Ephraimites. Well, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. And then he said to the men of Sukkoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I am, pursu- and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the elders of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? And Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Okay. Then he went up from there to Penuel, and he spoke with them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered him. And so he spoke to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. What's going on here with these two groups of people? They're trying not to be involved. They they know that to give bread and to to feed and support just an army of 300 would be a, a great cost, but they're saying, look, we don't see any evidence of you totally taking out the Midianites at this point, so we we're not committing. We're not gonna get our hand unless victory is assured then we're not going to get involved. And Gideon said, oh, it's assured, and when there's peace in the land, I'm coming for you. (laughs) They weren't even asked to join the battle, you see. They were just asked to give some support. They didn't make any bread, only excuses. Hmm? See what I did there? You guys still with me? Okay, all right. David Guzik said, when we set out to do the Lord's work, Often the resistance we face is from our friends. We can't allow this to hinder or discourage our work. We're going to ultimately stand before the Lord and we'll give the Lord an answer for what we're doing and how we're doing it. In verses 7 and 9, we see the faith of Gideon. He says, when I have the victory, when the enemy is delivered into my hand, when I come back in peace, and when he comes back, it's not going to be pretty. Well, maybe, maybe you're asking, okay, I mean, yeah, he's a warrior, but where's the grace? Where's the mercy? Well, how come he can't just move on and be a peacemaker like he did with Ephraim? That's a good question. What, what, Gideon, what got under your saddle, bro? Well, think about it like this. With Ephraim, it was just some harsh words and, and some pride. You should have called. But here with Sukkoth and Penuel, they were resisting the chosen leader of God and they were actually helping the enemy by not helping Gideon and his army with supplies. 
Do you see how this is different? Well, verse 10, now Zeba and Zalmunna were at Karkor and their armies with them, about 15,000 men, all who were left of all of the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. That's where we get the 135 thousand total number from. And then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents on the east of Noba and Jogbaha, and he attacked the enemy while the camp felt secure. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. Shows the persistence of Gideon, doesn't it? He fought the whole battle until the battle was won, and he went after the leaders of the opposition. Well, then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle, from the ascent of Heres, and he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him, and he wrote down for him the leaders of Sukkoth and its elders, 77 men. And then he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give you bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city and the thorns of the wilderness and the briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. And so what it's saying there is that he took these 77 leaders out of their village and had them lay down in the dirt and he whipped them with these briars and with these branches to teach him a lesson. Ouch, exactly. Well, then he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. Again, another public rebuke of their behavior. We, with Penuel, he tore down the tower and killed some men. We don't know the details, but there's likely some kind of justification for this. And he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? And so they answered, as you are, so they were. Each one resembled the son of a king. And then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, then I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. So apparently, these two kings were responsible for killing Gideon's brothers at Tabor. And how or why they were targeted by the Midianites, we do not know. But what we do know is that they're going to die. In the Mosaic Law, back in Numbers chapter 35, we find that God permitted a family to have revenge or take revenge uh, regarding the death in their family that was someone that was murdered. And so there was no police force at that time. Uh, There was, however, a system of checks and balances. And we we saw that in the book of Numbers where um, if you had accidentally killed someone, the head of an ax flies off and strikes the head and they died, now their family is after you. You could flee immediately to the city of refuge and if you got in, you were safe until they could have a, have a hearing and the avenger could not go in there and kill you. And so there was, a, there was a mechanism for that. But however, if it was found out by the elders in this system of hearings that you actually killed him like it was you know, first degree murder kind of, kind of thing, intentional, then you're out of the city and the avenger could do his deed. This was justified, but Gideon's firstborn was not ready to avenge uh, the death of his uncles or kill the enemies of Israel. His dad saying, okay, get, uh, you know, son, go ahead and take him out now. And you could just imagine, you know, uh, I can't do it, dad. I can't do it. This, this was also probably on Gideon's mind to humiliate these kings that they would die by the hands of a youth but it it didn't work out that way. And so Zeba and Zalmunna, they said this, they said, rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. And so they deserved death, and they even encouraged their executioner. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, 
Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. God raised up Gideon to be a judge, but the people wanted to make him a king and start some kind of royal dynasty with his sons and his offspring. But this was not God's revealed will or plan. It was one of the people wanting a king. It was one that they borrowed from other nations. You know, we'll see that later on in, in Samuel where people are like, we, we want a king. You know, we want a king. Israel wasn't to be like the nations around her, right? She was supposed to be different. She was supposed to be separate. She was supposed to take her cues and her instruction from the Lord, not from what everybody else is doing. Boy, that's a good lesson for us today, isn't it? She was supposed to be a light to the other nations. The Lord was to be her king. And sadly, over time, Israel became more and more like the pagan nations around her. So Gideon refuses to be made a king. And I'll tell you, there are, are some, if not many, commentators that believe that this is a greater victory than beating the 135,000 strong army of the Midianites. That he would say no to being made the king of Israel. Interesting. So Gideon said to him, I will not rule over you, nor my son will rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Then Gideon said, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, that's beside the crescent ornaments, pennants, and purple robes which were on the kings of Midian and besides the chains that were around their camels' necks. <laughs> so, okay. Sadly, what we're going to see is a downward spiral of Gideon. Sad but true. And so what does Gideon do here? At, at first, there's a great victory. He refuses to be made king. But then what does he, what does he do? He takes up an offering. And he goes, okay, I'll tell you what, just this one thing. He already had all the plunder from the two kings, which would have been amazing. And the chains around the camel's necks. And he had the robes. And so because of this culture, most likely all of the men had at the very least one gold earring in their ear, possibly two. So they all said, yeah, you bet. So all these earrings that they plundered off of the Midianites, they're carrying them around and they, they dump them out on this garment on the ground, and it would have been a huge pile, and we're talking about a shekel of gold, a measurement of gold, some kind of weight of gold. A lot of times it's, it's difficult to calculate a biblical measurement into our you know, dollars or current contemporary value, but it's been estimated that this would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $964,000. So almost a million dollars of gold are put at his feet. Well, verse 27, here's what happens next. Well, then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Oh, no. And thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so they lifted their heads no more, and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Gideon, what are you doing fashioning your own ephod? That's, a, that's an article of clothing for the high priest. And interestingly enough, we don't see one mention of the high priest in the entire book of Judges. The, it was a beautiful uh, chest plate or breastplate on the high priest's you know, garment and all the different things. It, was, it would have been amazing to see. Maybe some of you have seen an artist's rendition of a high priest. But it would have gemstones, 12 of them, in rows symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. and had all kinds of ornament, ornamentation on it. But behind it 
would be a pocket and would have something called the Urim and the Thummim, which at that time, the high priest was to use that for the discerning and discernment of God's will. And so Gideon makes an ephod. It's hard to say what his motivations were. On the good side of motivation, it was maybe to spark some godly spirituality amongst his people, win the hearts back to the Lord. I don't know. But God had determined that true worship should be at Shiloh in this time. And so for Gideon to have temple implements in his hometown at Orpha was not right before the Lord. Furthermore, no matter what Gideon's intention was, maybe it was totally pure and upright. We, we don't know, but no matter what it was, it, it was something that the town and the Israelites ended up playing the harlot with. It means that they started treating this, this thing as an idol. And it was a snare. They committed spiritual harlotry with it. It could have been seen, actually, it could have been seen by other people, even if Gideon didn't think it was, as a monument to Gideon and to his warriors, his 300, even though there might not have been an engraving. This monument hereby stands for the faithful service, but everybody would know, hey, what is up with that breastplate that's in the middle of the town square of Orpha? Oh, well, that's, that's the monument to, to Gideon's victory over the Midianites. All that gold is from all the earrings from the, from the Midianites. So what we really see here is compromise. He shouldn't have made an ephod. He shouldn't have set it up. And it's the first of many steps away from the Lord. And so Midian ended up being subdued. The land had rest for 40 years. And then Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, that's Gideon, went and dwelled in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring. For, oh no, Gideon, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name is called, he called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash's father in Ophrah of the Ab Abizrites, right? So it didn't end well for Gideon. He didn't become king, but it seemed like he lived like one. And I'll tell you, with all these wives and then this concubine, when you look at the people in the Bible who, who had wives, this is never something God said was okay, when people had multiple wives, it was heartache and difficulty and tragedy. And Gideon not only had wives, but he had at least one concubine. He was starting to adopt the moral standards of the locals. Never a good idea. And here's this, this concubine, and she's... Not that it's even right, but she's not even in his hometown. She's all the way up in Shechem. God warned us about this. This is in the context when Israel would want to set a king over herself. And he communicates that the leader must have to be an act kingly. And God says, basically back then, that a king could not go around multiplying wives and, and horses, okay? And that, what's interesting, too, is that that's the same today for spiritual leadership, for a deacon and an elder. He has to be the husband of one wife. He has to be a one-woman man. You can see this, this passage in Deuteronomy, that the king is not to Multiply wives for himself, verse 17 of Deuteronomy 17, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And so we see this downward spiral. Now the son that he had with the concubine, he named him Abimelech. And the name is interesting because it's his son, and the name means my father is king. So maybe there was something he was thinking in his heart in that way. He was, he was popular. Maybe he thought that he deserved all, all of this. It's sad to see how his heart had changed for the worse over the years. A great word for us comes from Andrew Bonar, a Presbyterian minister in Scotland who is a close friend to D.L. Moody. He said, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. Be watchful as, after the victory 
as before the battle. And so it was, and it was so, excuse me, as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal beareth their God. And thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So as soon as Gideon died, the people once again played harlot with Baal. This worship of the ephod during his lifetime led to total apostasy after his death. But one final word on Gideon, the judge, He had, I believe, of all of the judges, the worst odds, 450 uh, to 1. He was called upon by God to deliver Israel, but after the Lord brought victory, Gideon's leadership, actually, even with his failing at the end of his life, it brought peace to Israel for 40 years. That's, That's at least a good thing. When we talk about peace, I was thinking about the the glorious truth that you and I can can not only have peace with God because of Jesus, dying on the cross for our sins and being raised from the dead on the third day, but we can have the peace of God because of what Jesus did. And how do you you say, man, man, I, I have peace with God, but how do I have the peace of God? Well, a great passage in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it says this, It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what's the result? The result is verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that interesting that so often we think that we can get peace or resolution in our minds and just get settled if we can just... I don't know if you've ever said, I just need to get my mind wrapped around this thing. This this piece of God that he promises to us, it bypasses our understanding. And what does it do? It allows us to have a peace even though we don't have everything figured out. My friends, this is a power verse. I've I've, I've always heard for a long time, when in a fix, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. It's good news for us. We have peace with God. We have the peace of God. We just have this peace because of Jesus. And and it's it's peace that doesn't come from our mind. It's not peace that the world can give to us, where they say peace or peace out or whatever. It's, It's totally different. Like Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. That's the kind of peace that we can have in these difficult times that we live in. And I I know it's difficult on a macro scale. It's difficult on the micro scale. When you boil it all the way down to our alarm clock going off and you getting out of bed and you face the day. But guess what? God's the God of it all. He's the God of it all. And he's never going to leave us or forsake us. And he's looking for people who are willing to stand up and say, I will go send me. And that's us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for uh, these things, Lord. We thank you for um, that these verses and these chapters, they were written for our learning, Lord. We're thankful that you have given us this testimony in the Old Testament and you are so faithful to be teaching us and discipling us through your truth. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would allow these things that we've looked at to nestle and settle down in our hearts. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to be ones who are standing on your promises in these last days. Help us to be ones who, that we we won't bow to anything but you, Jesus. Lord, we want to be fruitful in our ministries. We want you to say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so, Lord, help us, empower us by your Holy Spirit to be the people that you're calling us to be and to move out and move forward and do the very things that you're calling us to do. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you so much in your name. Amen.